Уважаеми колеги, скъпи гости, за мен е чест да приветствам всички вас от тази трибуна. Следващия час и половина ще имаме възможността да проведем обсъждане по една, смятам, ключова тема с особен принос за изграждане на по-справедлива и приобщаваща Европа. В времена, когато се провежда обществена консултация с европейски граждани в контекста на големия, но не еднозначен дебат за бъдещето на Европа, за посоката на нейното развитие, най-добрият начин Европейския съюз да покаже своята Продължението Decreasing the economic and social divergences between and within the member states are of greatest significant, significance for the overall economic welfare of the European Union. Bulgaria appreciates highly the European pillar of social rights, which was proclaimed in last November in Gothenburg as the tool with a valuable and political character on one hand and a tool which can be expertly applied from the other hand. The significance of the social pillar has the potential to determine the sustainable development of the European social model. Implementing the European social pillar is our joint political commitment and responsibility of the EU and of member states alike, taking into account the socio-economic differences and the diversity of national systems, as well as the differences in the member states in light of the social partners and in compliance with the subsidiarity and proportionality principle. In the context of, of the aging and decreasing population, globalization, technical progress and digitalization of societies and economies, it is of utmost importance to invest in the human capital to support productivity, growth and stable economies for uh, participation in society and at the labor market in transition. The European pillar of social rights must be viewed as a tool to increase the extent of uh, cohesion between member states in the area of social policy, gap in incomes and demographic challenges. The successful Im implementation of the pillar will allow the EU to keep and adjust the European social model to the intensively changing industrial relations. It's a continuation of the Europe 2020 strategy in the labor and social sphere. As a president of the Council of the EU, Bulgaria initiated constructive discussions in order to form common views and positions to implement the aims of the pillar. In addition, the Bulgarian presidency aims to encourage the debate on the social dimension of Europe, the future of the European Social Fund and the social aspects of the next multiannual financial framework. Designing the funds, investing in human capital, the rules for their implementation must aim to provide the necessary level of funding to social Europe. It must be sufficient in order to support and complement the national efforts to provide better employment and of greater quality and quantity in order to meet the challenges related to the future of labor, support governments and combat youth unemployment. In order to provide for real economic and territorial cohesion, we have to continue supporting the measures in education and innovations. Thank you for your attention. Dear guests, dear colleagues, allow me now to give the floor to the professor uh, Katya Vladimirova, who has a PhD in economics and who will be the moderator in the key, uh, who will moderate uh, the key interventions of our esteemed uh, speakers in this session. She is a professor in leading uh, Bulgarian uh, universities, the University for National and uh, World Economy and the New Bulgarian University. She is a professor at the Institute for, for Serving of the Population 
at the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences and a guest lecturer in a number of foreign universities. Please bear in mind that requests for the floor will be taken up to the end of the interventions of the keynote speakers. Professor Vladimirova, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, it is an, a great opportunity and honor for me to participate in this high-level meeting under the Bulgarian presidency. Setting up a peaceful, more inclusive, better and social Europe is a long-standing dream and goal of millions of citizens. Microphone. In today's world, after the Second World War, a range of supranational unions was set up across all continents, similar to the European Union, across northern and uh, southern uh, America, in southern Asia, BRICS. But the EU spans even more policies and actions that none of these other structures have. And these are the social aspects, the social policy of the European Union providing for social rights in the context of a more inclusive and fairer Europe, achieving goals, determining the future of uh, the human being, including in the context of uh, the UN development goals. I would like to say that the goals provided for by means of programs, instruments, and tools of the EU in order to develop dynamic, competitive, strong, and social economy while sharing responsibility and enriching each other is extremely important. This set up the, sets up the basis for a stronger Europe, providing uh, better living conditions and better labor conditions for the European citizens. I'm happy to see my country, Bulgaria, Sofia, to host this meeting. I'm happy to hear that the topics discussed here aim to solve issues related to greater social justice on the basis of shared resources. To us, this forum is extremely significant in the context of uh, decreasing the existing divergences between member states, regions, and social groups. In this respect, the Bulgarian citizens have great expectations regarding the matters to be discussed at this forum, especially the topics related to the European pillar of social rights. The 20 areas in the European pillar of social rights focused on equality, better payment, work-life balance, better living and working conditions, social protection, inclusion, care for the uh, elderly, homeless, children, vulnerable groups, providing access to public services, building one Europe for all. Equal opportunities and access to the labor market are among the most important factors. But in order to have them, we need access to education and lifelong learning as a prerequisite for higher and more secure income or for social protection. I'd like to highlight the key importance of inclusive education in the application of the idea to build potential in all citizens in order to be included uh, at the labor market for greater social security, eliminating exclusion and achieving equality. Gender equality is equality for all in all spheres. It is a main prerequisite in order to achieve work-life balance, achieving a greater extent of social inclusion and development and to successfully solve the demographic problems that exist and deepen in many regions of Europe. The idea of equal pay for equal labor that is set up in the European pillar of social rights is a new aspect of the equality topic and the topic of equal pay. Implementing this idea is of key importance in order to overcome with payment 
to deal with payment gaps, not only across sectors, but also across other areas of the economy and public life. Decreasing drastic differences in pensions and other incomes between population groups. Achieving success in this area would be one of the greatest achievements of the European social policy and maybe on a global scale as well. For a social Europe which has uh, relatively limited human resources, it is very important to include everyone in education, labor, and social security. This is a great challenge to the aging Europe with high levels of low qualified or uneducated groups of the population. In this context, creating potential for inclusion by means of education and inclusion from an earliest age is of crucial importance. In conclusion, I would like to highlight the following. It is very important to provide better working conditions, better life, decent life to citizens in Europe. And this means that we need to combat the informal economy, the gray economy, where many European citizens are still employed and which can find its place in European policies, including policies of the social partners and the civil society. Thank you for your attention. Now allow me to give the floor to uh, our keynote speakers for this session. First, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Luca Jaillet who is the president of the European Economic and Social Committee. And uh, my final uh, sentence actually uh, was a, a challenge for him as well. You have the floor, Mr. Jayer. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Professor. Dear President, uh, Honorable Member, I am really honored to address today your Conference of Parliamentary Committee for Union Affairs. And I wish particularly to thank the chair of the European Committee of the Bulgarian Parliament, Christian Wigenin, for his kind invitation. I am particularly glad to be here at the very beginning of my mandate. I was just elected on the 18th of April as president of the European Economic and Social Committee, the House of Organized Civil Society at the EU level. I am really convinced that close cooperation between COSAC and ESC is of foremost importance as we, the House of Participatory Democracy, are here to complement the key role of you as representative democracy. I believe the national parliament have to be necessary partner for the implementation of the European social pillar of social rights. In a time of nationalistic and populistic trends, rising inequalities, aging society, poverty, digitalization, globalization and migration, as already mentioned by, by the chair, the EU has to deliver on social progress to improve living and working condition in Europe, as stated by Madame Professor. Although growth is back in the EU, poverty is still touching 24% of Europeans, and in my home country, Italy, youth unemployment is standing at 33%. With these figures in mind, one cannot be surprised at protest vote and risk of mistrust in democratic institutions. I'm sure you would agree with me that the EU must urgently address the root causes by the discontent of its citizens and reinforce what it has neglected before, namely the social dimension of its policies. DSC has for a very long time called for a stronger social dimension before the EMU and at large of all the European Union. We made a great effort to prepare the discussion on this uh, Europe, European social pillar, and uh, we accompanied the process with three main opinions based on the direct input of national civil society organization and large debate we re realized in 2016 and 2017. So when the pillar of social rights uh, was finally proclaimed at the Gothenburg Summit in November 2017, we recognize that it was a step in the right direction. But is all, we always told that it is obvious that the proclamation of the pillar cannot stand alone. The implementation will be the real test. 
the pillar must become now a positive force for Europe and its citizens and should address the imbalances between economic and social policy in the EU effectively. It is a policy response to the challenges of poverty and social exclusion, but this policy response will not be credible without significant financial support and legislative action. The principle of the European pillar of social rights and the need for its implementation should constitute one of the guiding lines in the negotiation of the next EU multi-annual financial framework. In its opinion, the SE has asked for a roadmap for the pillar implementation and a clear division of tasks between the different actors. Here, member states must, be a, must play a crucial role. Making a reality of the social pillar will require improvement in member states and a robust budgetary base, investment and current spending. Spending needs are particularly large in lower income countries and in countries that suffered income declines in recent years. Scope for more spending can be created within member states and with the help of the various EU-level programs. Also, private sector investment can make a contribution in some key areas, but will not be enough and cannot ensure against the exclusion of the socially weakest. We think that more public investment within member states can be facilitated with a reference to a sort of golden rule for public investment with a social objective. We do allow more flexibility in budget rules with a view to achieving the aims of the European pillar of social rights. We think also that more public investment can also be directly supported by the use of the existing EU instrument, aided the European Structural and Investment Fund or also the last European Fund for Strategic Investment. Last proposal of last week, I, if I remember well, of Vice President Katainen, Invest EU is another very good step in the good direction. And finally, appropriate taxation policies, including effective fight against tax fraud, tax avoidance, and aggressive tax planning, should allow member states and the EU to raise additional means to contribute to the financing of the social pillar. The European pillar should also be linked closely with the general EU strategy to implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And we hope this will be clearly indicated in the document to be adopted by the Commission in the months to come. As one of the main tools of implementation, the Commission has lastly proposed a new social scoreboard to be used when issuing recommendations under the European semester. And we think the European semester should be the key uh, element of governance and implementation of the pillar. There is a consensus among civil society organizations that this scoreboard, with currently 12 indicators, needs to be aligned with the 20 principles of the social pillar. The Commission has also put some different legal and non-legal instruments. I will leave to the Director Hag to present this. But however, as development accelerates, we will have to follow and also to take this proposal from serious and take a step forward. The Commission should also enhance the European Social Fund social inclusion strand alongside the other two strands, education and employment. And we think that a minimum of 30% or more, not less than the current MFF of the European Social Fund Plus should be air market to combat in poverty and social exclusion. Many ideas on how to implement the social pillar and even additional ideas can be put forward. However, nothing will happen if we do not work together. National Parliament and EU institutions are close partners in this and our in particular, also due to the specific subsidiarity role. We must work shoulder in shoulder to make the social dimension come alive and to make sure that European Commission proposals are implemented. Some proposals, of course, can be changed, but if they are just blocked or too much postponed, this will amount to doing nothing. And doing nothing is not an option today. In the case of non-action, citizens will turn their frustration against all those in power. 
And I think uh, we think that citizens will not distinguish so much between the EU national government and national parliament. And protests can and has found an outlet both in European as well as national parliamentary election. Therefore, we need clearly to work together either at European and national level to create results around this pillar and the implementation of the pillar. Together, we can make the difference in implementing the European pillar and strengthen the social dimension in Europe to the benefit of our citizens. For this reason, I very welcome the last draft of your final declaration. I found very appropriate and very in the good direction. I will strongly support a euro with protect and care is the strong good answer to the challenge of a Europe of progress, growth and cohesion as a cornerstone of any sustainable competitiveness and future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gerier, for your interesting ideas, proposals, first and foremost for your understanding and support, uh, namely joining the efforts of all institutions, national and European ones, to implement the ideas and the social dimensions of development. Specifically, thank you for the idea to develop a roadmap for the implementation of the pillar and other ideas how to solve the problems of youth unemployment, poverty, social exclusion. Indeed, the organization you represent is a reliable partner uh, in implementing the EU policies. Allow me now to give the floor to the next speaker, Mr. Marcel Haag, who is the Director of Political Coordination, Directorate 1 in within the European Commission. You have the floor, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, the European Pillar of Social Rights is a major achievement for Social Europe and uh, also a hallmark of uh, the Juncker Commission's uh, commitment and ambitions in uh, the social field. Um, President Juncker first presented the idea for a um, European social, uh, Pillar of Social Rights in his State of the Union speech uh, before the European Parliament in September 2015. In the aftermath uh, of the deepest economic and social crisis in living memory, the goal of creating the pillar was to launch a process of upward convergence, a process to improve working and living conditions uh, across the European Union. The pillar has been conceived in the face of deep changes in our societal, technological, and economic realities. Its purpose is to serve as a compass that helps us design policy responses that address uh, technological, societal, and economic challenges effectively. The Commission has presented its proposal in April 2017 um, after a very thorough public consultation in which also the uh, Economic and Social Committee, as we just heard, uh, played a, cru a crucial role. Uh, the pillar was then jointly proclaimed by the European Parliament, the Council and the European Commission uh, at the Social Summit in Gothenburg in November 2017. This was an important moment for the European Union as it sent out uh, not only a very strong message on social Europe, but also a very strong message uh, of unity uh, of uh, the EU member states. The broader context in which the pillar is to be seen is the debate, the ongoing debate, about the future of Europe uh, on which um, uh, leaders will meet in May 2019 in Sibiu uh, in Romania and uh, the joint proclamation here is, uh, was an important milestone also in this, uh, in this process. The pillar sets out 20 key principles um, which cover three main areas, equal opportunities and access to the labor market, fair working conditions, and social protection and inclusion. 
the pillar, with this, the pillar addresses uh, a broad range of issues, ranging from inclusive education to active support to job seekers to social protection. But, um, of course, the implementation of the, uh, of the pillar is key, and the implementation of the pillar is a shared commitment. Um, the European pillar has to be implemented uh, at both the level of the European Union and at the level of the member states uh, within the respective competences and, um, uh, and, uh, and powers of the different levels of governance. Uh, we speak here about a political uh, commitment uh, and it's important to stress that the pillar does not change the existing divisions, uh, division of competences and powers between the European Union and the Member States. Employment and social uh, policies continue to be, to a large extent, in the hands of the Member States. This means that national parliaments uh, have also a key role to play in implementing the pillar. Um, when I refer to the pillar as a shared commitment, it uh, means that also the EU level has, of course, its important role uh, to play. Uh, the uh, EU institutions uh, do this uh, mainly in three ways. Firstly, in those areas where the EU has a mandate to propose legislation, uh, we take the pillar forward. Just to give you one example, in April 2017, the Commission uh, presented a proposal on work-life balance. Other areas um, in which proposals were recently made concern the access to social protection and transparent and predictable working uh, conditions. Um, the second way uh, in which the pillar is taken forward uh, is the European semester, indeed. Uh, in practice, this means that the uh, European Commission identifies challenges that member states face in the employment and social field, uh, and the Commission prepares um, country-specific recommendations to address these challenges. The Council uh, of Ministers has the final word in this process. Um, the EBSCO Council, in charge of employment and social affairs, um, is set to agree on a new set of recommendations at its uh, next meeting uh, later this month. The third element um, that I want to mention is uh, the EU financial funds uh, and programs. Um, the Commission has recently, uh, recently made uh, proposals for the future uh, multi-annual financial uh, framework for the 2021 to 20. Uh, 27 period, uh, strengthening the social dimension in the uh, 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 in uh, the EU finances and the implementation of the pillar are a key aspect. Um, the president of the um, uh, Economic and uh, Social Committee has already mentioned uh, the strong investment dimension, which uh, uh, clearly also has. Um, has a social and employment um, uh, dimension. The Commission proposed, in addition, um, uh, to this very strong focus on, on investment, also a new, uh, a new cluster of funds and programs dedicated to investing in people, social cohesion, and values. Overall, um, the Commission proposed to allocate a budget of almost 140 billion uh, euros to this. This cluster will include the new um, European Social Fund Plus, the Erasmus program, the European Solidarity Corps, and the programs for Creative Europe and Justice, Rights and Values. As you can see, um, the Commission uh, is making full use of the instruments that the uh, EU treaties um, uh, provides it with uh, in order to, to take the pillar forward. However, um, I would like to stress again that it would be wrong to believe that the pillar could be taken forward single-handedly single at EU level. We all have to make a joint effort bringing together the efforts at EU and national level. Thank you very much.
Благодаря ви, господин Хак. Thank you, Mr. Hulk. Specifically for outlining policies and technological aspects of the implementation of the European um, pillar of social rights, its future and the link to resources and the high expectations that we have of the pillar. Allow me now to give the floor to the next speaker. Mr. or Dr. Ljubos Blaha. He comes from Slovakia, from the Slovak Republic, and chairs the European Affairs Committee of the National Council of the Slovak Republic. You have the floor, Mr. Blaha. First of all, I would like to appreciate very much the Bulgarian presidency for opening this issue of strong social Europe, because I think that uh, strong social Europe is crucial for the future of our continent. The European pillar of social rights is extremely important for the survival of the European unity and social peace. Why? Uh, we see the rise of the right-wing extremism caused by the social frustration and rising fears of the working people from the drastic consequences of globalization, deregulation, and liberalization. We also see the hegemony of neoliberal and technocratic economic thinking, which weakens the social cohesion, equality, and communitarian values in the European Union and compromises the European social model. I believe the European project is not sustainable if there is a huge regional and class inequality and if the business Darwinist thinking is going to kill the European solidarity. Let's return to the roots of EU integration. Let's return to Altiero Spinelli Ventotene Manifesto with its social emphasis. I think the pillar is one of the most important acts of Juncker's commission, and hopefully it can bring more social face to European Union. As we say in Slovakia, the famous slogan of Alexander Dubček, let's build the socialism with human face. I would say today, let's build European Union with human face. Well, I will uh, raise also a few problems of pillar. First of all, in many ways, the pillar just repeats the same social rights which were stated in the European Social Charter, the Social Charter of the European Union, and Charter on Fundamental Rights. I found only one or two important improvements when the pillar speaks about the social rights of homeless people, it's very important, about paid leave, and I very much appreciate the fight against the poverty of working people. But I see also some step backs from the previous social charters. First, the principle of workers' co-determination in the companies is now weaker than before. Second, the wording of pillar is more pro-market. Liberal leaning, the first priorities are in the typical liberal leaning. There are the values of opportunities, skills, flexibility, etc and not the classical social democratic or social market leaning, the values of social equality, redistribution, or workers' self-management. This is a problem. Third, in the paragraph of, on pensions, there is the principle of the equality of men and women, which I totally support. But I would surely defend more social advantages for mothers as regards the pensions and the retirement. In my country, during the Soviet socialism, the mothers had the right to retire earlier according to the number of children they raised up. And I believe these positive social affirmative actions toward the mothers should be involved in the pensions policies in the Europe. Now I will continue and be more generally. I would question the overall changes and trends in the European social policies. On the one hand, we solemnly adopted the pillar with its social rights, but these are only the words. However, on the other, other hand, the new proposal of multi-annual financial framework wants to reduce the money for the cohesion policy, which in reality means the less help for the poorest people and poorest regions. 
It's just in the direct contradiction to pillar. Next example. On the one hand, the pillar speaks on social protection and equality. And the European Commission even rightfully proposed the regulation on coordination of social security systems. But on the other hand, some member states want to indexate the family benefits for the children who live abroad while the workers pay contributions in their countries. This is absolutely in contradiction with the European values of social cohesion and it's discriminatory. So I really welcome that Visegrad group countries are concerned with this in its latest resolution from Warsaw. My last and concluding remark. The main practical tool of the European institution for fulfilling the pillar are the social cohesion and other structural funds. Just imagine that the European Union is the unitary state with the social pillar as its constitution. Question is, who would get the most of the social benefits on su in such a European state? The answer is the people in the last, least developed regions. This is the moral fundament of social policy, to help the most excluded and the most poor people. But how it is possible to take serious the solemn declaration about social rights when the European Commission in the same time deprives itself of the budgetary resources on cohesion policy and propose to reduce the money for the most vulnerable social classes and regions? This is my main concern about the pillar. It's really solemn, it's really nice and quite social, but it's, like, it's not like a political project but more like a poem. Without the real political and financial background, it's aesthetically good to read it. It's aesthetically good to perform it like a poem, but the social economic effect will be zero. Let's do something about it because we extremely need the real social Europe, the Europe with more Dubcekian face. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Blacha, for this very well uh, defined and uh, well argumented statement concerning the past, linking the, fa the past and the future. And thank you for your idea to build up a Europe with a human face. But we need to pay more attention as to how this can be done and if it can be done. So there are a number of issues which can uh, be uh, touched upon in the next contributions. Delegates, before we start the discussion, I would like to ask you to keep your interventions up to a minute and a half. The timing will be visible on the screen in front of you. Now let us proceed to the debate in essence. I would like to give the floor first to Mr. Georgiou from Cyprus. It is uh, true that uh, we had a breath of fresh air from Mr. Blachan from Slovakia when he talked about a, a juster and more balanced Europe. Indeed, uh, the motto of uh, the Bulgarian presidency tells us about uh, uh, standing united uh, and being stronger that way. But who is strong and who is united? Because it seems that Europe is moving at several different speeds. Uh, good legislation is promulgated. Uh, uh, sound directives are issued but uh, the social challenges are unbearable and the gap between the north and south is very great. So no matter how many pillars of social rights we may proclaim, they will remain dead letters unless there are, is a true focus on a more functional and fair European society in terms of action. So the aim is not just good legislation, but uh, actually moving towards uh, fairer societies. They will become fairer uh, if, and uh, Mrs. Vladimirova 
described this uh, vision, which goes back some years now. Uh, if we can be move away from uh, materialism and put a more humane face, a more sensitive face on our continent uh, so uh, that uh, via our values uh, we can indeed honor those who had the vision for a united Europe decades ago. Mr. Bizet, France, you have the floor. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Chair. When I spoke earlier, I mentioned the single market. It was in connection with Brexit. The single market is a market of 450 million consumers, the biggest economic market in the world. And I mentioned how important it was to keep that market at a time when we're seeing our structures fragmenting as a result of Brexit. But the single market will only be able to fulfill its potential if, in parallel with that, we have a European pillar of social rights so that we have a more inclusive and a fairer Europe. Let's not be under any illusions. We can't create a, a social Europe overnight, but we must have a gradual move towards internal unity so that we can erase the distortions of competition and ensure that the union's values can spread across all the member states. Uh, there will be a certain parallel with the, the economic and monetary union, which still needs to be completed. But I think that uh, I'd just like to mention the fund for adjusting to globalization, because the digitalization of the economy and the energy transition may leave some of our fellow citizens by the wayside. The second thing that's important is that coordination of the social security schemes is important in order to uh, avoid uh, social tourism and fraud. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Kavadia, Greece, you have the floor. Chair, dear colleagues, the financial crisis that erupted in 2018 onwards left a deep impression to EU finances, especially to the Union's social policies that were connected to working rights and social provisions. Policies that boost investments need to be supported as the easiest and most secure way to ensure social and financial cohesion in the Union. Brexit, that was more or less a symptom of the deep crisis of the restructuring process of the Union, posed also as a cause for the weakening of the EU common policies. Greece, in particular, has made a titanic effort towards the right direction while paying a heavy toll of wage and public investments cuts and welfare fund withdrawal during its recent deep financial crisis. Our country has finally managed to meet EU financial requirements regarding the year gross surplus and financial numbers in general. After three memorandums that kept Greece under strict financial supervision, we are approaching a period of gradual financial emancipation with efforts that focus on stabilization of surpluses, increase of public investments, increase of public welfare measures as a counterpoise for wage and pension cuts, especially for the workers' social groups. Furthermore, we are trying to bring to justice people and groups that are responsible for the financial draining of the Greek state. We focus on creating new jobs for the highly educated Greek youth to prevent further brain drain and motivate them into remaining and creating in Greece. Finally, with agreements like the one accomplished between the Greek government and FIROM, we strive to create a safe and positive environment for doing business in the Balkans. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Karakopoulos, Greece. Thank you very much, Chair. The deep economic crisis uh, has uh, given us a, a, a labor situation which is a lot uh, uh, worse than many years ago. So we have very high levels of unemployment. Uh, uh, 
and uh, a lot of flexibility forced on those who do have work. So basically, we're paying for work below cost, and Greece is particularly affected. Uh, we also have a mass migration. Uh, away from the country of young and highly educated persons. We're talking about hundreds of thousands who've left the country. And the result of that is, of course, a demographic uh, shrinking because we also have a, a very uh, low birth rate. That, of course, is a problem more or less throughout Europe. Uh, we can't talk about a real effective social policy for Europe unless we tackle the demographic issues. The theory that says that to renew European population, uh, it will suffice to allow migrants in, well, that's been surpassed now. That's outdated. What we need is a joint uh, demographic and family policy at European level, which will aim to increase the birth rate and protect families with three or more children in all member states. Now, that would mean a horizontal policy, for example, uh, for tax incentives, uh, health, education uh, allowances, uh, etc. And uh, we, we can't uh, close our eyes to a major problem which, faces, which, which all our countries face. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kurjepo, Poland, you have the floor. And dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy that Professor Vladimirov invited us to these discussions and reflections about better and deeper sensitivity in Europe to cohesion and justice. In Poland, the law and justice government has taken major steps based on sustainable development program. And what Mr. Marcel Haag said is very much in line with what the Polish government is currently doing. And this is what we are proposing that in paragraph 5.2 in our final conclusions, we do make a mention about uh, social cohesion and convergence in line with the economic development of the member states. Uh, dozens of social programs uh, could uh, could be mentioned in the current among the current current uh, Polish government's activities. My colleague Blaha, in the introduction, uh, made a broader context about it. Uh, in broader terms, but we have to be realistic and specific. So in Poland, uh, child benefits, uh, uh, housing benefits uh, for, uh, for Polish uh, citizens, uh, support for Polish mothers, and so on and so forth. This is exactly the cohesion. This is uh, applying social justice in practice in Poland. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Vingriana has the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Dear colleagues, Undoubtedly, the new initiative of European pillar of social rights is an ambitious and benevolent one, mainly because it encourages us to look for balance between economic and social policies in time when extremism seems to be regrettable popular. The pillar covers what should be the common guiding principle of social well-being, and while they are hardly new to us, their realization is becoming increasingly difficult due to emergence of new forms of employment and various new social challenges faced by every member state. It is important to stress that while we do believe uh, the EU uh, has uh, the collective task to striving uh, for the implementation of the principles, we also realize uh, the upholding uh, the ideals of social rights pillar is the duty of the member states themselves. Uh, we can't expect any significant changes to simply descend it upon us from the glass corridors of Brussels. This means that despite our best intentions, we can't reasonably hope a draft universal one-size-fits-all solution for this, as our national legislation systems traditions and social economic specificities are totally different. So even tough, um, the pillar provides a strong basis for taking action at the national level. It should be implemented by taking into account the circumstances of the different member states. 
the distribution of competences at EU, national and local levels, the subsidiarity principle and the autonom autonomy of the social partners needed to be taken into account as well. I'm, so, I'm sure that all of the delegates who have been here today are sincere in their pleasure to work hard towards the goal of providing our citizens with dependable social security and employment relation. Thank you. Thank you. Now the floor goes to Madam Marques from Portugal. Thank you. May I start by paying tribute to the work done by the Bulgarian presidency and by thanking Christian Viginen for having organized this Kozak plenary. Thanks too for yesterday evening's dinner and cultural events. With regard to the European Pillar of Social Rights, I have two comments to make. The European Pillar of Social Rights must be looked at in the context of the European semester. And we do see that little by little account is being taken of the European Pillar of Social Rights in the European semester. And we're rather in, in agreement with the way things have been presented here. Uh, but there's one important point we must not overlook. We do have budgetary targets, which are quantified. But the social targets are not easy to fit with those ob objectives or targets, because the, not enough budgetary resources are provided as would be required under the European uh, pillar of social rights in order to make those rights concrete. My second comment is about the digital transition. The digital transition should not lead to new discrimination. In, we don't want to find ourselves in 10 years' time deploring the fact that there were people excluded from that digital uh, transition, uh, just as there are people affected so much by globalization today. Uh, there are quite a few people who have been forgotten about in globalization and are being forgotten about in the digital transition today. Hence, uh, the need to include everyone in the digital transition. May I end with a question? Looking at uh, the European policy agenda, uh, one might be inclined to ask how the social rights fit together for uh, people working on the digital platforms. I have no idea. Thank you, Mr. Björk from Sweden. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to start by uh, agreeing with the introductory uh, speech where it, it was said that citizens can see the benefits of the social pillar, and this is important, but the social pillar should also be considered important so that citizens do not consider digitization, robotization, etc. as a threat. In Sweden, we have long experience of handling transitions in society thanks to strong social security networks. And as members, we could also see uh, challenges as opportunities, not as threats. Just as the delegate from Lithuania, I'd like to underline that the social pillar is important, but it's also important to point out that the main responsibility lies within the own member state. As a Swede, I would also like to underline that it's important that we also consider different countries and the work, uh, the labor market models in different countries. In summary, though, we should uh, recognize that the social Europe is also the basis for a modern and successful Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schenach from Austria has the floor. Thank you, Sia. Thank you very much. I'd like to start by thanking the keynote speakers very much indeed. I don't think we can take it as a given that uh, we can be talking now about uh, a European pillar of social rights. We needed the Gothenburg summit for that because a stool or a table with, uh, that doesn't have four legs is a very wobbly item. Goods, services and capital do flow around the EU, but in certain member states uh, there is not enough attention paid to uh, the social aspect. We need more social jurisdiction. We need, for instance, a European Labour Office. Uh, we promote European research, but we also need to change our budget. 
at present the budget would give the impression that uh, Europe is a continent of agricultural development. We need to change that. And with the fundamental rights in the Lisbon Treaty, we want to secure the concept of equal pay for uh, equal work. And we want uh, breaches of labor law to be tackled. We don't want them to be got around by the Posted Workers Directive with uh, straw firms in another state pretending to employ uh, people in uh, a different member state. And uh, by having HGV drivers allegedly employed in a country where you don't have the same high social standards as they would enjoy at home. We've got the social fund, we've got the globalization fund, we've got the combat poverty fund, but we don't have the true jurisdiction. And the member states, the European Commission and the European Parliament are going to have to move to ensure that this pillar created in Gothenburg is given flesh. That's the future. And then I think that buy-in by our citizens in the EU will increase, rather than just becoming an economic and monetary union or banking union. Madam de Santa Ana Fernandez from Spain. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Thank you very much. The social dimension of Europe is one of our major challenges uh, in uh, European pursuing European integration. So 20, the member states of the European Union are uh, spending 50% uh, of all social spending for the world around. Uh, now, sustainable development has to involve social progress and better cohesion, and social policy also has to be considered a factor for production and not just about uh, the provision of uh, safety nets. So this is one of our major challenges for uh, the future. We uh, have, it's also an area which the citizens can identify with. It's not just about development uh, and growth. It's also about the feeling of belonging to the European Union. So Europe needs to be seen to provide solutions to citizens in terms of their daily needs, and it needs to protect them. It needs to be seen to protect them from social exclusion. The citizen has to feel himself at the heart of the European project, and that is the only way in which we will uh, surmount the major crisis in confidence that is growing in the European Union. So uh, we have also uh, to do that in order to face up to the uh, increases in uh, populism, xenophobia and uh, nationalism. Now, we want equal opportunities, fair uh, so, uh, working conditions and uh, su sustainable social protection, social security. So. Cohesion, convergence, uh, and uh, the in uh, internal market are also key parameters. So we welcome the proposed pillar of uh, social rights, but it also, of course, has to take account of the various particularities of the member states. But it is uh, one of the key uh, challenges for the 21st century. Mr. John from Germany has the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. The European Union emerged from an economic union, and this is part of the design problem. Uh, the social pillar to date was missing. I think that an emerging from the crisis we all experienced a few years ago, we realize that acceptance of and buy-in to the European Union amongst people in our member states will only occur if they see an added value. And that added value means a social security network, which means that we must tackle the living conditions and the social conditions of our populations. That's one of the tasks of the EU. I'd like to make one point. I think it's important that in many of the free trade agreements negotiated by the Commission and eventually voted on by the European Parliament, we always call for a sustainability chapter. 
and it's also about the living conditions in the countries with which we conclude these free trade agreements. Now, if we insist on it for them, we should do it too for people in the European Union. I think that that is essential. One final point. I agree with one of the previous speakers. It doesn't really fit if you make cuts in cohesion policy, which has been a success a policy like uh, the social uh, fund can be a policy, but it doesn't really fit if you uh, if you neglect people. Thank you, Madam Gersutel from Belgium. You have the floor. Thank you, colleagues. Peace and stability in the European Union depends on sustainable welfare in its member states and therefore on strong social protection. This has been enshrined in the European Social Charter and the EU treaties, as Mr. Blaha reminded us. Unfortunately, the economic project of the EU has so far largely neglected the social framework to go with it. Social policy has too long only meant job creation based on a recipe of deregulation. Colleagues, the pillar of social rights offers a valuable compass, but what is it really worth? Indeed, the European economic and social agenda for the next years should be much more ambitious if it wants to reduce social inequality, exclusion and poverty, if it wants to promote gender equality and contribute to the creation of sustainable and high quality jobs. It will also need to provide for the necessary social investments. And in order to achieve all of this, we will need binding measures, strong instruments and financial incentives to make it happen. Let me make two suggestions. As a first suggestion, take the Stability and Growth Pact, SGP. At least four areas of public social expenditure should be considered for exemption from the corrective and preventive arm of SGP. Early childhood care, primary and secondary school education, training and active labor market policies and affordable and social housing. These fields are increasing prosperity because they improve labor productivity and reduce societal inequality. As a second suggestion, the social scoreboard must be used as input to the European semester so that the European semester also enforces clear social objectives in the same restrictive manner as it is currently imposing on budgetary rules. Giving friendly recommendations to member states will not be enough, I'm afraid. Colleagues, if we want to win back the hearts and the minds of our citizens, we'll have to offer them not only prosperity and security, but also social protection. We therefore seriously need to strengthen and implement the pillar of social rights. And I will end by quoting François Mitterrand, who said, Europe will be social or will not be. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hansen, Norway, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Norway supports initiatives to strengthen the social dimension of the European cooperation. The European Pillar of Social Rights is a positive initiative to that end. It is important to start by ensuing better enforce existing regulation, but it may also be need for new rules and systems. Good and fair working conditions are necessary parts of a well-functioning markets. Thus, I see a need for develop a coherent European strategy for combating work-related crime. The Norwegian Prime Minister has launched an initiative to that end. The proposal for a European Labour Authority can contribute to more cooperation and better enforcement. However, I would like to underline that the new authority, as well as other initiatives, must respect the different national labour markets model. To a large degree, the Nordic model leaves to the trade union and business organizations to negotiate wages. It is also based on a strong cooperation between employees, employers and government. This three-part cooperation works well. It's based on mutual trust and respect and is also important to faci facilitate necessary structural reforms. One example is that uh, a new pension reform was agreed in Norway without one single day of strike. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Hillary, Germany, you have the floor. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Bundesrat, the upper chamber in Germany, I'd like to say a couple of words about the social dimension. The most important aim of the social dimension of the EU should be to ensure it has a much higher profile. 
and what we do for our European citizens should have a higher profile. That's why we must develop this further. In Germany, in many cities by Pulse of Europe and other movements, it seems that there's a huge need to develop a social Europe, a more political Europe. Preconditions for this are, of course, first of all, strong social partners. They're the precondition uh, for having strong trade unions who can negotiate properly for our citizens. So a, an enhanced social dialogue must occur in Brussels as well. Another precondition, in my view, is also everyone's solidarity so that all regions, all municipalities, all the local stakeholders recognize that Europe exists and that it's there for them. In Germany, very often regions feel that nobody's looking out for them. And so it's important that uh, Europe have an impact there too. Our aim should not be to have the EU social model uh, made a uniform one. This is a common concern in Germany when debating social Europe. Instead, it must hold out prospects for true improvements in the standard of living of all Europeans. So we're not talking about having uniform conditions. The national or regional features should be accommodated, but at the same time, we must uh, ensure greater social development. A first step might be a common European unemployment benefit. I know that there's a lot of tension around at the moment. In conclusion, I'll simply say how important it is that in the budgetary negotiations coming up, the European Structural Funds and the European Social Fund are built up together with Erasmus+, Plus, which I set great store by. It's important that we all together ensure in future we get a genuinely social Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Mr. Van Appeldoorn, the Netherlands. Thank you, Chair, and, and the panelists for discussing uh, the European pillar of social rights, the, the human face of the EU, as my colleague uh, Mr. Bla put it in his passionate plea. Uh, most of us uh, do want to have strong social rights in the EU, but the question is how to achieve this and how to have rights that are also legally enforceable. Uh, one option that thus far has been rather lacking from at least recent debates is the role that could be played by the European Social Charter of the Council of Europe, which in fact offers strong protection of social rights, but involvement of the EU could strengthen the Charter, while vice versa, this could also strengthen the social pillar of the EU. So one possibility would be to explicitly refer to the European uh, Social Charter in the guidelines for impact assessments. But arguably a bigger step forward could be an accession of the, of the EU to the European Social Charter. In this way, the legally binding social rights of the Charter would be integrated into the EU legal framework and, and ensure that these rights are also always respected by EU policies and EU laws. So I'm keen to hear the whole panel's opinions about whether the, the root of the European Social Charter, rather than maybe the legislative agenda of the Commission, could in fact be a good way of making the European social pillar a reality for Europe's citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Leyes, Latvia, you have the floor. It's EEP party. Cohesion funds raised Latvia's standards by 19% in a few years. Still, we have not quite reached the EU level average. Improving social and economic conditions have helped slow down our working force leaving Latvia for higher paying jobs in the western part of the EU. People are now in fact returning because wages are growing, but not fast enough. Our citizens are still leaving, though in much diminished numbers. Fact is, in mostly Ireland and Great Britain, they have contributed 15 billion euros to these countries' wealth. Since the Great Recession, should not these wealth generation contributions be factored in the next MFF cohesion funds? By the way, the receipts we have received back from these countries nowhere compensate the wealth our people have generated in the western part of Europe. Thank you. 
Thank you. Mr. Durkin, Ireland, you have the floor. Uh, I think the most fundamental uh, policy to create stability and social and economic stability is investment in jobs. I think that having come through the kind of economic recession that we came through in Ireland uh, over the past 10 years almost now, I think it is a salutary lesson for us uh, that in order to achieve uh, stability and peace in the workplace and in the economy in general, we need to invest in jobs, in education, in upskilling our, our labour force, in switching to uh, new employments that replace those employments that have become obsolete. If we do that and we do that successfully, and I believe that we are doing that to the best of our ability now, I think we will be successful. One of the things that I remember about eight or nine years ago at a COSAC meeting was the question was raised, where has Social Europe gone? It was a simple answer. The countries, the member states across Europe could no longer afford it. That was the problem. And if we do not have economic stability, if we do not have economic investment ongoing, then we won't have social security, we won't have things like social housing. And for example, the whole area of social in the housing area is an area that, 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 that I am amazed at over the years. We didn't have what you call social housing. We had economic housing and economic policy that provided houses for people to buy or to rent in the public sector. We was never called social housing and it was better when we had it that way. Thank you. Mrs. Thier, France. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I think the diagnostic is clear for everybody. The European Union is facing up to a number of challenges in the social area. Uh, so the social pillar is, ne it is necessary to make it a priority. For a very long time, we thought that social development would happen on its own. The harmon social harmonization would go along with economic harmonization and would be facilitated by the treaties. Now, we can see that social Europe is a concept for now and not a reality on the ground. The discussions about the revision of posting, posted workers shows the difficulty that exists in trying to reach a consensus when it comes to social harmonization. Now, today, social harmonization is necessary, both in terms of social justice and in terms of economic efficiency. It's a question of survival for the European Union in general, and above all, it's a challenge to get it accepted by our citizens. And in the Eurozone in particular, it's illusory to think that we will manage to have an optimal functioning of the European Union while wages and employment rates are variables. The problem, however, that our national models are currently competing with each other. So what we need right now is a real political willingness. And the question is, are we able to achieve that right now? Thank you. Mrs. Kretso, Romania, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. Dear friends, we all could agree that a main real, not fake at all, uh, reason of our citizens' discontent with the EU, it is the effect of having a single market but 28 different social systems, an economy without borders, but social indicators and responsibilities with national borders. This situation allows an unfair competition and increasing inequalities, very much exploited, as you know, by populist and eurosceptic parties. The competition between companies in the market we are used to praising for its uh, supposed role in economic progress, it has been replaced by one between working classes living in different member states, producing a kind of com convergence to the bottom, and a weaker and weaker solidarity. We support a strong social pillar, welcoming the current proposal, but seeing it as being somehow marginal, a set of palliative measures, limited not because of lacking legal basis in the treaties, but because of lacking political will 
for a change, for different reasons in West and East, in North and South, but lacking, however. Uh, the main social issues, it is not, however, the absence of a legal framework for social rights. European Union has an income distribution problem fueling social unrest and undermining social fabric, actually. The fourth industrial revolution with digital economy and automation will make the situation even worse, as long as our social security system, our many systems, actually, and the large majority of the social rights are linked to the fact of having a job. We need increasing awareness about the current changes in the production system, imagination, political courage, and innovative solutions, quickly. The future have, has already happened yesterday, and nobody in this room is old enough for not living it. Thank you. Thank you. I give the floor to Mr. Crockwell Island. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on the issue of social uh, uh, rights, uh, the European pillar, I'm delighted to hear this afternoon a number of people speaking about the need for strong trade unions working in harmony with employers and government uh, to provide a solid basis for their, their country. Sadly, a lot of the legislation that has been brought about through the union uh, over the years, uh, employers, generally private sector employers, but some public sector employers, seek to exploit that legislation. For example, the uh, contract of indefinite duration, which was intended to give workers uh, some comfort in the jobs they had, has been exploited to develop zero-hour contracts. Uh, and this is something that the union must work with. My colleague already addressed the issue of homelessness and uh, the health service. Health, education and homes should be a basic human right in any of the European states. And this is something that unless we get that right, we're going to run into trouble. 92% of Irish people support membership of the European uh, project. Sadly, the 8% have the loudest voice. And we are now living in a, in a world where the minorities, the populace, are driving people away from this project, this marvellous project which has brought peace to the continent, which has brought pros prosperity to most countries. But because the populace have the loudest voice, we must start delivering the message to the people on the ground and stop running away from the decisions we negotiate and we make. This, um, I'll conclude on this, in the areas of education and health, the European Union has competence to support, coordinate and supplement the actions taken by member states. It's vital that any decisions in these areas be taken at the most appropriate level so that the implementation of pillar respect, uh, the remit and role of the member states. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Thank you, Madam Yonova. Thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, Ukraine is on a track of long-awaited reforms which will create the ground for our country to build democratic and social-oriented state. Allow me to inform you that recent years Ukraine uh, has achieved significant pro progress uh, on European paths and cooperation with the EU. As a result, we have association agreement, establishment of deep and comprehensive free trade area, introduction of visa-free regime with the EU, and now European Union is the largest trading partner. Also, we streamlined our homework on joining to agreements uh, of uh, conformity, assessment and acceptance of industrial uh, goods. We are thinking also about uh, uh, future steps in a strategic terms. We should start on examine our accountability to the uh, four EU freedoms, free movement of goods, services, capital and persons. And that is why Ukrainian president, government and parliament, we are so committed in, uh, uh, to create a customs, digital and energy unions. 
Also, we have remarkable changes in such areas as judicial reform, decentralization, energy efficiency, pension reform, and healthcare reform. I would like to remind that, unfortunately, because of Russian aggression, we have 1,800,000 internally displaced people. And that is why we also uh, have uh, adopted a legislation to defend their rights. Ukraine is changing, and together with colleagues from Georgia and Moldova, which also have a cessation agreement, we are very committed to fulfill our homework. And I would like to underline that we are Eastern Partnership countries. We belong to countries of Eastern Europe. We are not buffer zone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Baroness Verma, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And um, I'd like to just make a couple of points, Madam Chairman. A number of speakers have spoken about the rise of populism within their countries um, and also talked about um, social rights. I think what we need to recognize are two things. One, that national governments are really responsible for making sure that working, living rights in their countries are top of their agendas. And those are then best practice shared across our European partners. I think it's important that we speak up of the strength of what the European model does. And I think we should allow and encourage debate. Um, a number of members have also spoken about Brexit and the single market. And of course, uh, Madam Chairman, what we would like to see um, leaving Brexit is that we still retain a very strong relationship with all our member um, countries and that the um, workers' rights, whether they are in the UK or in our member states, that those UK rights, um, uh, member state rights are equal and that no, no person living in any country feels that their rights are not being upheld. And we have put into place in debates in the UK assurances to members in our country that those rights will be upheld. Um, Madam Chairman, we have committed in number of interventions in recent days, and I'm sure member states would have looked at them, pay gender parity, um, looking at um, harassment rights, all of these things add up to ensuring that workers, people living in the UK, feel protected. Thank you very much. Lord Hay, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> and can I... <clears throat> further congratulate the Bulgarian Presidency for their well-constructed background paper for this topic. Uh, the House of Lords EU Select Committees are currently scrutinizing four substantial dossiers relating to the European Pillar of Social Rights. In its correspondence with our committee, the UK government appears broadly satisfied with the direction of travel on these proposals in the Council. It notes that member states have stressed the importance of subsidiarity, and it notes that member states have stressed the need for discretion to adapt matters to their local circumstances. Our committee is happy with this progress and hopes and believes that the thinking behind the dossiers will be reflected both in EU policy and in UK policy post-Brexit. Finally, can I associate myself with the myself rather, with the excellent suggestions of Mr. Van Appeldoorn of the Netherlands Senate and his question. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Varela, you have the floor. Spain. Good afternoon. Many colleagues have spoken already, and it's clear that we agree that inequality is one of the key or major problems uh, in uh, Europe. Um, we are facing, of course, uh, uh, the migration problem as well, which highlights issues to do with racism as well. Anyway, uh, we need development uh, and growth, and we don't have enough of it, and that means poverty. and. Uh, if we want uh, a democratic uh, Europe of solidarity, which uh, we, we have to work harder, that's what our citizens want. And um, if we allow austerity to rule, and uh, if we, uh, we will continue to see millions of uh, working poor. Now, public spending uh, means that there isn't enough 
redistribution policy is are such uh, that uh, not enough is reaching those who need it most. Uh, we have huge potential, uh, and uh, I come from Galicia, which has all that potential, and uh, we are working to try and ensure that no one is left behind in our society. But uh, often, policies don't get uh, go far enough. Uh, we want uh, a Europe for the for the majorities. Uh, and uh, we want a Europe of persons and peoples. Mr. Tilvar from Romania. Thank you, Chair. Dear colleagues, I'd like to say a few words about the common future of Europe. This will be built thanks to the efforts of citizens and uh, their representatives we should be going towards uh, social Europe. As politicians, we have to look forward beyond our beyond the rights and obligations in the treaties in order to strengthen cooperation in the area of education. In other words, we have to build a future for the young people. In member states, we are culturally diverse. We have also inequalities. Some um, countries do not have the same democratic experience as others. However, diversity is a source of wealth and a guarantee of the strength of the Union. It is. It needs um, common efforts, including from people who work in other countries than those they were born in and who have to adapt to the fact that history has been less generous with their countries. We have to focus on an equitable, on a fair Europe. The right to health services should be the same everywhere in the Union. The social pillar needs strong economies in all European countries and regions. If we manage to promote economic Convergent convergence will uh, find solutions for social problems as well. Thank you. Thank you. The last. Mulțumesc. Ultimul. The last speaker, Mr. Madison from Estonia. Thank you very much, Madam. Fascinating debate, really. Wall-to-wall -wall suggestions how to ensure more equality and more well-being. I love what Margaret Thatcher used to say. You eventually run out of other people's money. That's the problem with socialism. So if there's equality, there's perhaps not freedom and vice versa. Those are the facts. The only thing that brings us well-being is economic growth, creating jobs and diligence. All this talk about more redivision, transferring things from one pocket to another, well, that's socialism, and socialism is bound to end badly. When we talk about equality, well, how many countries would be willing to copy Estonia's system? 18 months paid salary to mothers after they had a baby. So the countries who insist on more equality, would you be willing to copy our system? Perhaps not, and I wouldn't insist on it. All countries are different, really. Our problems are different. But all those problems started with one thing, that's demographics. This is why I loved what the Greek colleague said he was one of the few people today who said, well-being cannot grow if we don't see more births and more people, because that's the foundation of well-being. And this is why Europe has been doing so well in a well-being society. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for your comments. And now I'd like to give the floor to Professor Vladimirova. I will ask uh, Mr. Marcel Haag to briefly respond to the comments uh, we just heard. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Madam Moderator. Uh, I will uh, limit myself to um, uh, to uh, three comments and um, uh, and an apology. Maybe I start with the apology uh, to get this out of the way. Um, I am uh, not in a position to answer the very specific question on the European uh, Social Charter because I'm not an expert for the uh, Council of Europe uh, legal system. What I can tell you is that uh, that uh, when the Commission was drawing up the pro its proposal for the uh, uh, social pillar, uh, it worked closely with um, the colleagues from the uh, Council of Europe, but also the colleagues from the uh, International Labour Organization, uh, to make sure that the pillar is uh, uh, fully coherent and consistent with, um, uh, with the Council of Europe and the ILO rules. Um, not being an expert for the um, uh, for the uh, Council of Europe uh, system, um, uh, I um, have to say this would have to be this would have to be uh, studied by my expert colleagues uh, more closely. Now, um, uh, if there is any similarity to um, the accession that, as you know, the European Union uh, is committed to uh, with, the, with the Lisbon Treaty to the uh, European Convention of Human Rights, uh, then there would be significant political and legal um, uh, uh, obstacles that would, have to be, uh, that would have to be overcome. As you know, um, the, the uh, European uh, uh, Court in Luxembourg has uh, given an opinion uh, on the question of the accession to the uh, uh, e uh, to the ECHR, um, uh, and said uh, and has set out um, how potential difficulties um, uh, can can be overcome, uh, but uh, the problems there, the technical and legal problems, are really uh, quite big in that area. Now. Um, I'd like to come to my to my uh, three brief points. Uh, first of all, um, uh, what I take away from from the from the discussion uh, is and and um, uh, and uh, different um, speakers said it in different ways. Um, the objective is is very clear. Some talked about um, uh, the need for Europe with a more uh, with a more human face. Others talked about. Uh, a Europe that uh, has to provide concrete value added for its citizens. Um, uh, there seems to be a very uh, um, uh, large agreement on on this being the the objective, and this objective is is also shared by uh, by the Juncker Commission. Uh, and then one will have to have a, a discussion on the ways. Uh, to, to get there and uh, what that concretely means for, uh, uh, for, for uh, family policy uh, and uh, for the pension rights of, of women. And there I, can, I, I could see that there are uh, very different uh, views on, on the way forward, but that is, that is, part, of the, that is part of the political process um, uh, to um, to find an agreement and, and, and take decisions on these. My second point um, uh, is uh, on the importance of the single market. Some, uh, some speakers refer to the single market um, uh, directly, others uh, indirectly by raising different issues. Uh, and indeed, the, the single market is at the core of the European project and is also at the, at the heart of um, uh, of social of social Europe, um, it is important that the single market is supported by um, a strong social safety net. It's important that this uh, that the single market delivers uh, upward uh, uh, social and economic uh, convergence across uh, across the EU. A process that has stalled uh, 
as a consequence of the crisis and where uh, um, it is of utmost importance that the EU finds its, back, uh, uh, finds its way back to uh, becoming the uh, convergence engine uh, that, uh, that the EU has been uh, uh, up, until the, um, uh, up until the crisis. Um, it is also crucial that this um, uh, single market is based on rules that are uh, perceived as fair, um, and not only um, uh, that the rules are being per perceived as fair, but also um, uh, the um, implementation of the rules is, is being perceived as, as fair. Um, the Commission has made a number of proposals, including uh, a proposal for a European Labour Authority um, that go into the direction of making sure uh, that um, uh, that um, there is no cheat there is no cheating um, in the Europe uh, in the uh, single market uh, and uh, that the rules are actually uh, also being complied with. And my third point would be on implementation. Implementation is absolutely uh, is absolutely key. Um, uh, the, um, the 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 social pillar um, must not remain a poem. And uh, in order to to make sure that this is not the case, um, these rights and principles that are set out uh, in the uh, in the uh, European pillar of social rights have to be implemented. We have to make progress uh, on turning these principles and rights into reality. And that is something uh, which is in as much uh, a European challenge uh, as it is for each uh, member state uh, to, to deliver on. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Jaye has the floor for a few words of conclusion. <coughs> thank you so much, Madam Moderator. First of all, I want to thank for the high level of the debate that, uh, although there were some nuance, but all the direction were in the same direction to saying that the social pillar uh, is a key cornerstone for the future of Europe. Of course, no one of us wants to speak about the pillar as a poem, because if we define or we leave the social pillar and what was proclaimed in Gothenburg as a poem, we are saying that uh, the European Treaty is only a poem. <laughs> because from one point of view, there was no need to adopt the social pillar in Gothenburg, because quite everything is already written in the treaty. As uh, the ESC said in an opinion demanded by the President Baron Pei at the time he was president of the Council, one third of what is written today in the European Treaty concerns social issues. And if you look to the Charter uh, uh, of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, it's also in the same direction. But we need the social pillar as a political act to reestablish a balance and to establish a perceived per consensus and a perceived compass of all the institutions and member states. And I think that the difficulty of the process that will, uh, was going on for two years before the adoption and even the last minute difficulties for the adoption in Gothenburg tell us that this pillar was more than fundamental. I think, and that will be my two short consideration. first, that for the future of Europe, we have two crucial points to deal with. The one is concerning the identity of Europe. And this is what is in the Article 2 of the treaty. It should be read, reread, reread every day. It concerns fundamental values fundamental rights, but also solidarity, social justice, non-discrimination, and so on. And the second is concerning what European Union aim to realize. That is fixed in a very clear way in the Article 3 of the treaty. That is the concrete political manifesto, the, the concrete uh, guideline of what we agreed all together to do. And if I read only one part of this Article Treaty, it said that the aim of the Union is a highly competitive social market economy 
aiming at full employment and social progress. It was already stated in our Constitution. So this is already established. The problem is now the implementation. And the pillar established a sort of uh, chart of principle that need now roadmap and concrete action. Some could be legal proposal, as the one mentioned by the Commission now. But from my point of view, the two major ones for the specificities of the social policy will be first, the European semester. And the, in the European semester, we have to work, as some of the interveners have underlined, for transforming also the social scoreboard in binding one. This was exactly what we were demanding at least a few years ago as ESC and also in the debate of the parliament, it was in the same line. We need to have this European semester scheme as a scheme of common governance, respecting the diversity, but going in the same direction, but using indicator as scoreboard with binding rule, as for the deficit, as for the growth, as for the investment in innovation, as for sustainability, as for climate change, and as also for the social issue. If you do not build up a sort of direction using this instrument, this is an instrument is accepted, see a rule of Goran, national parliament, European institutions, and so on, we will lose the exercise. And the second will be the budget, because the discussion about the budget, either the amount of the budget and either the balance inside the budget and either the way to spend the budget to use the investment will tell us if we are serious about the intention and the roadmap of we, we want only to stay at the level of a poem. Just the last uh, sentence. I think that we have an urgent need to come back to consider as one of the champion of the liberal thought in Europe, Einaudi, that was the president of the Italian Republic, was said that the, the expenditure in the social sector are not a cost, are a key investment, because we need to build up a resilient and a more solid capacity to be competitive in the world of today. And so if we do not come to this concept and after consider this social investment as investment with all the rule of an investment, perhaps we will lose, we will come back to a poem and not to a project. I am still convinced that we can do the, uh, of this article three of the treaty or with the social pillar is a way to make this evident, a, pr a concrete project for the future of Europe. Thank you, Mr. Zhe. Finally, in conclusion, allow me to sum up in one sentence, because we're short of time. Thank you all for this extremely interesting debate which we carried out. It was rich in ideas and proposals, but of course there is a lot of hard work ahead of us in order to implement them. I wish you every success. Esteemed colleagues and guests, Thank you for this most fruitful discussion. I think it was indeed very timely and very useful to us all in the context of better cooperation uh, in the uh, course of the exchange of information and ideas among uh, national parliaments and the European Parliament. Now, some technical announcements to all delegates, except for the uh, COSAC chairpersons, there are buses to take you back to your hotels. They are at the entrance. As for the chairpersons, there is a short break for you, and at five o'clock we resume, you resume in the same uh, meeting room. Thank you. I thus close this, this session. See you tonight at dinner.